So it's fitting today we're going to talk about worship. (laughs) It's a privilege and a joy to be back with you here today. For those of you that may not know me or I haven't had the privilege of getting to meet, my name is Hannah Arrowwood, and um, this is my third time to be here at KBC, and it's just a privilege and a joy. You guys are like second family. Someone said, welcome home. I was like, yes. Um, So I hope that you know that this, this this is a home for us and our team, um, there's such a joy to be among family, sisters and brothers in Christ, even though the 8,000 miles separate us on a normal day. So um, I'm just, it's an honor to be able to talk to you about the thing for me that is the most life-altering thing, and that's about this understanding of what worship is. Um, in America, at my church, I'm, a, our, one, I'm our worship leader. And so I have the privilege of getting to facilitate a team and lead worship every Sunday. And so, but there's this reality of that it's so much more than the songs that we sing. And so often, for a lot of us, we think that's what it is. We think it's about the songs that we sing or the melody that's being played. And I hope by the end of the day, you'll just realize that it's so much more. So um, I'm going to just pray for us. If you will, close your eyes. Abba, I love you, and you are the object of my affection this morning. God, I place you on the throne, the throne of my heart. And God, I pray that everyone within the sound of my voice will do the same, Father, and recognize that these are your words that are being spoken. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would penetrate even the hardest of hearts. God, I pray that every one of us would choose to surrender to you today, that we would choose to obey you today, that we would choose to worship you in spite of our circumstances, in spite of what we see, in spite of how things might feel. Father God, I feel your peace in this place. And I pray that it would just encompass your people. I pray that as they breathe in deep, they would realize that it's your breath. You're the one that is the giver of our breaths. Every single breath we take is evidence of your grace in our life. So I speak to anxiety and depression and fear in the name of Jesus because they have no place here. I speak to that feeling of being overwhelmed and completely engulfed in the pressures of your finances and declare that Jehovah Jireh is your provider. God, I pray for those relationships that are wayward or that are tainted or torn, Father God, and that they will recognize that you are the restorer. You are the redeemer. You are the one that goes after the one. Your arm is not too short. You have not lost power. And that there is nothing that is impossible with you. So God, I pray that you would speak to your people and I pray that we would respond in worship to you this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. So I'm gonna be a couple places in the word of God if you wanna prepare yourself. I'm gonna start in Romans 12. I wanna set a foundation for you and I about this concept of worship because make no mistake about this. Worship is for God, say that. Worship is and is about God. Let's say it now all together, ready? One, two, three, worship is And is a, we've got to get that clear. Your worshiping God has nothing to do with your personality, has nothing to do with your past experiences and how you were brought up and what denomination or church you were brought up in, and it has nothing to do with your preferences. And when I say preference, I mean those things like your opinions about the music or your opinion about order of worship and your opinion about how things are orchestrated. Because the object of our affection can only be God. If it's anything else, it's idol. And so when we talk about this idea of worship, it's important to understand one thing. That in the kingdom of heaven, the culture of heaven is worship. Everywhere, every day, every moment of every second in heaven, they are worshiping the living, holy, powerful God. It never ceases. And the reality of it is is you and I are foreigners to this earth. We are citizens of heaven. If you declare yourself to be a believer and a disciple of Christ, you are not of this world. I am not a Kenyan citizen. I am not of this country, right? But when I show up here, I've got to adjust and adapt to the cultures of this country. 
When we talk about being citizens of heaven, we have to adapt and we're not supposed to adapt to this world. We're supposed to infuse the culture of heaven into the culture here. And if so, if the culture of heaven is worship, then our lives ought to reflect that every moment of every day. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This, this offering your body as a living sacrifice, this is your true and proper worship. So when you realize, when you read that passage, what this doesn't say is, if you choose to participate in the singing on a Sunday morning. What it says is, this, you offering your body as a living sacrifice, you surrendering daily, you obeying the word of God, you responding when God calls you to do something, you giving yourself away so that he can use you, that's worship. You give up the right to have a decision. You submit your will to his because he knows best. You say, not my will, but yours be done, Father. Who I marry is up to you. What college I go to if I go to school is up to you. What job I have is up to you. Where I go and live is up to you. And when you respond in obedience, that's worship. Worship is for God and is about God. But here's the reality. Worship to, in order to worship and engage, it requires our response. We must engage and be intentional to choose to worship the living God. And so we're going we're gonna to dive into this. So if you want to turn to Genesis 22, Genesis is the first book of the Bible, just in case somebody wanted to know. By definition, feeling that the definition of, it, of worship is the feelings or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. Worship is defined by the feelings or expression, which means there's action involved, of reverence and adoration for a deity. My ability to worship God is directly linked to my understanding of who he is. I cannot worship something I don't understand and don't know. Let me say that again. I am limited in my ability to worship that which I don't know. If the object of my affection is supposed to be what I worship and I am not engaging in understanding who, who God is, how can I worship him? And here's the thing. Our worship grows and it grows and it expands and it, and it, just, it just becomes this massive thing the greater we understand who God is. But make no mistake that our understanding or lack thereof cannot limit us from choosing to worship. Sometimes we have to choose to worship in spite of the fact that we don't understand what God's doing. You know, when we sing songs like, there's no shadow you won't light up, there's no mountain you won't climb up coming after me. I can sing those words and I can be engaged in what that is, but if I have been in the place where God has tracked me down and chased after me because of a decision that I made and I found myself out in a desert and he comes and meets me there, when I sing those words, they mean a very different thing. When he has literally stripped me of the lies that I believe that held me captive, where the enemy had grip a hold of me, when I sing, there's no lie you won't tear down, it means something very, very different. But the, way, the reason it means something very different because there's a deep knowing of the faithfulness of God. There's a deep knowing of the goodness of God. There's a deep understanding about this compassion and this unconditional love that pours out over me when I don't deserve it. And my response is to fall on my face and worship him. Because how else could I do anything else? So in Genesis, we're going to talk about a man who understood this very, very well. I'm going to give you some context to the passage. We're going to be reading in, con in Genesis 22, but you're going to have to understand some things before we get there. In Genesis 15, sovereign Lord, God of the creator of the universe, says to Abraham, I am going to give you a son, your own offspring, and from this son is going to be birthed nations. 
So here's a promise of God. Everybody say promise. And when God makes a promise, make no mistake about this. All the authority of heaven backs every syllable that he has spoken. And some of you need to be hearing that this morning. When he speaks, it's not in vain. When he speaks, it's not on accident. You don't just accidentally overhear what the sovereign God of the universe is saying to you. You hear because he's opened your ears and he wants you to hear. So when he speaks, all authority backs it. So when he says to Moses, I mean, what says to Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. And from your son, you're going to name him Isaac. From him, nations will be born. He meant it. So we see in chapter 15, the promise is given. Then we go to chapter 21, and the fulfillment of the promise happens, and the birth of Isaac takes place. But here's something interesting for you guys to note. When the promise was given to Abraham, he was 75 years old. That sounds like a funny promise for a 75-year-old man. I'm going to give you a baby? Look, I have teenage kids now, and I don't want to go back and raise no babies. (laughs) I'm just saying. 75 years old is when this promise was given to him. But do you know how long it took before it became to fruition? 25 years. He was 100 years old when the fulfillment of the promise happened. 25 years of waiting and believing that God's word is God's word and what he said he meant. Some of you are waiting. You're in that season of waiting. And instead of choosing to worship in the season of waiting, you're worried, you're afraid, you're anxious, you're doubting, you're confused. Did I really hear God? Is that really what he said? And I want to challenge you just to worship through it. Let your response, let your default be to worship him. Because when God speaks, he means it. So we pick up in chapter 22, and we know that now he has, the son is born, the beloved promised son, that nations are going to be born from. Make, think about that. This is a pretty big deal. <laughs> the whole world is going to come out of this offspring of this child, nations. And we pick up in um, Genesis 22, verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Circle that. If you're a note taker, if you write in your Bible, circle the word tested. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Circle love. Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, circle the word worship, and then we will come back to to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. And the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered him, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they had reached the place that God told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything. Now I know that you fear God and because you have not held with me your son, your only son. I had you circle three words, or I noted for you to circle three words. Tested, love, and worship. There's a practice, if you're studying scripture, it's called the first mention principle. Anytime a word is first mentioned in scripture, you and I should pay attention. Because it's helping us understand the context in which God intended it to be. Those three words, tested, love, and worship, are the first time we see them appear in scripture. And think about the context of the story in which it comes in. 
This is all about worship. It's all about our response to a sovereign God and his promises that he makes. And it's about this love that is very real between a father and a son. But notice what isn't here. There's no bands. There's no singing. There's no harps. There's no glorious angel choir. And yet it has everything to do with worship. You and I have to pay attention to this because what we do see is a willingness of a servant of God to sacrifice something in response to who God is. Abraham is willing to sacrifice his one and only son in order to fulfill what God has asked of him. And so for some of you, I just want you to, it's so easy to read this story and not like actually recognize what's happening. Imagine God asking you to not only sacrifice your child, but also the child that he's promised nations to be birthed out of. How confusing would that feel? And that's why it's so critical. Please hear me if you hear nothing else. You must know the voice of God. You must be able to discern the voice of God. Because I promise you, when he asks you to do something, most of the time it makes no sense. And if you can't discern the voice of God, how can you respond in obedience? And that is our greatest form of worship, is to respond in obedience because we believe God. Check this out. Why could Abraham respond the way that he did? If you go back to Genesis 15, where the promise was originally given, 15 verse 6 says this, Abraham believed the Lord. It's pretty simple. Abraham believed the Lord. He believed what he said. He believed the promise was going to happen. He believed the beloved son, would, he would be given his son. It would be birthed through him and nations would be birthed through Isaac. He believed it. And so we fast forward that here we have Abraham and his son Isaac are, he's planned it, he's cut wood, he's spent three days traveling, he's brought servants along, and he comes to the point that, that God has pointed out. And he says to his servants, I want you to catch this, because this is what ties to that Abraham believed the Lord. He says to his servants in verse 5, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will what? And catch this. We will worship and we will come back. We will come back. Not I will come back. We will come back. He's going to sacrifice his son, y'all. That's a southern meaning for you. <laughs> Sorry, it come, came out. I got excited. <laughs> That Abraham is going in response to what God has said to sacrifice his son. And he says, we are coming back. There was such confidence. There was such deep assurance that we are coming back. Not just me by myself, but me and my son. Because the promise is through my son. And I believe God. How could that be? When Hebrews 11, we find out. This is why I love the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's this one beautiful picture that ties everything together if we will just hunger for an understanding of the word. Hebrews eleven seventeen 17 says this. Everybody say, by faith. Say it again like you believe it. Say, by faith. By faith. By faith. Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise him from the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive, it, receive Isaac back from the dead. Abraham didn't care how God kept his promise. He relinquished the right to have control. He didn't care if he provided a lamb or if he raised him from the dead because he believed the promise of God and that the promise was Isaac and through Isaac. And so he was able to say, we will go worship and we will come back. 
One way or the other, God is who he says he is, and our response is going to be to worship him. Guys, what if we lived that way? What if we lived that way? What if we believed the promises God has spoken to us, the promises that are found in his word, and we actually lived that way? We all know that Abraham and Isaac, I mean, he's one of our forefathers of our faith. We read about him, we study him, and he's set to be an example for you and I. So when God asks you to do that thing, I bet there's some of you right now that have that thing in your mind. When God is asking you to do that, is your response to worship him? Is your response, because here's the thing, let's be clear. You don't always feel like it. Anybody? You don't always feel like doing what God is telling you to do. I feel that way a lot, if I'm being honest with you. (laughs) And I like to try to rationalize things with God. And then finally, my spirit gets to the place where it's like, I tell myself, be quiet, Hannah, and just say yes. We have a saying in, in my family and at our house, just give God your yes. It's just easier. Just do it from the beginning. Don't argue. Don't put up a fight. But here's the thing. If you can think of that thing right now that God is asking you to do, there's this reality that it's going to be tested. The promise of God is going to be tested. Let me say that again. Some of you need to hear that again. The promise of God in your life is going to be tested. It has to. Because God has to know that you love him above all else. Above recognition, above material or fame or material gain. He has to test your heart. And if you and I would just embrace the testing and we would be willing to fall on our face and worship before him, guess what? The the world would never be the same. What's your default? Is it to worship? One of my favorite stories in the New Testament is where Paul and Silas, two of the disciples of Jesus, went and were thrown in jail. They were thrown in jail and they were there because they were thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. They were being persecuted and thrown in jail. Well, they're in jail and guess what their default was? Anybody know? It was to worship. They began to sing a song and they began to lift their voice in praise to God based on who he was. Worship is for God and about God. They began to praise his name based on who he was, not their circumstance. And guess what happened? This miraculous thing happened. As they're worshiping, not only did their chains fall off of them, but so did every other person in that jail. What if your worship isn't for you, but it's for somebody else? What if your willingness to lift a voice of praise and to live a life that honors God is so that someone else's freedom could be obtained? Isn't it worth giving a sacrifice of praise under that circumstance? Isn't it willing being tested in the fire so that that fire can burn up all the things that aren't of God so our hearts could be pure and reflect that of Jesus? There was a point in in my life about 10 years ago where I found out that the doctors diagnosed me with thyroid cancer. And if you're like any, that word cancer, it just scares people, right? Myself included. And I remember at the time saying to God, "Um, this is a problem. (laughs) We're going to need to reevaluate this, and I'm going to need you to take care of this. And here's why. Because my whole life, I've been involved in worship ministry. Like, there is this... I don't think I'm the best singer, but I've been, I think I've been anointed. And there's so, that you just recognize what God is doing in your life, right? And so there's this reality. I'm like, excuse me, God, I, you're sovereign. I mean, no disrespect. But how do you expect me to serve you if you take away my ability? Because the doctor had told us the mass was wrapped around my vocal cords. And, he t- and the doctors told my husband she'll never sing again. Well, obviously he was wrong, right? But here's the reality. In that moment, it was a life-altering, pivotal moment in my life. Because what God said to me, he said, Hannah, I don't need your song. I need your heart. I don't care if you ever sing another song on a stage. Give me your heart, Hannah. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I love you. I serve you all the time. We're in leadership. Because here's the reality. Worship is a matter of the heart. 
It's not about talent. It's not about gifting. It's not about any of those things. Every single one of you in this room can offer your bodies as a living sacrifice in pure, true worship to God. Yes, there's an element biblically commanded that calls us to lift a shout of praise and to sing in his presence and to clap and to dance before him. Yes, that's what God wants us to do. Which is why it doesn't matter what your personality or preference is. I want to respond to God in the way he asked me to respond to him. But for me, there was a period of seven years of stripping. Anybody like stripping? I don't. (laughs) I hate it. But in this stripping, there was this reality, and I came face to face with the sovereign Lord. And what I beheld was beautiful. And I began to understand this intimacy with him. And the worship that took place in my prayer closet, where no one was around, no one ever saw, the moments that I had with the Father in that place changed my life. The the moments that happened in that place give me the strength to keep going the days I don't feel like going. Those moments in that place with that secret place and the intimacy with the Father allow me to have the strength to say yes when he's asking me to do what feels like it's impossible. This, this corporate stuff should be overflow. It should simply be the overflow of what's happening in our life daily with the Lord. But some of us walk into this room and our response is, what I need from you, God, Instead of, God, what can I offer you? There's an offering, there's a sacrifice that has to take place. For some of you, it may be sacrificing praise because you're in a really hard season. It may be sacrificing thanksgiving and declaring that God is good and we enter his courts with thanksgiving. That may be your sacrifice. And praise God for it. Some of you may not feel like he's good right now in the season that you're in, but I would challenge you to align your spirit with what God says is real, that what he says is true, regardless of how you feel. There are so many mornings in my own time, whether I'm at church leading or places where I will sing until I believe it. There are times I don't. But even in my unbelief, my cry is, God, help my unbelief. Because I know in the depths of my soul who you say you are. That is not changing. That is firm foundation. These feelings, this trying to figure it out and navigate it, that can be wavering sometimes. But I'm confident in who God has said he is. So I'm going to ask the band to come up. And we're going to sing a song, and I invite you, I invite you to join us with it. I'm going to read to you the lyrics because it's just a powerful image. Because here's a reality that I think, for me, was life-altering. In this whole process of the Lord stripping, in this whole process of the Lord teaching me to have a heart that's postured before him. The reality is the scripture tells us that he invades the praises of his people. He inhabits the praises of his people. And so I want you just to visualize for a second. I want you to close your eyes and imagine for a minute the reality of that. When God spoke, he literally created the stars. When God spoke, he made land where there was nothing. When God spoke, he put breath in your lungs, people. And he is saying, when you praise me, Not when you sing, but when you praise me, when the posture of your heart is bent towards me, when you praise me, I come and I invade that place. I dwell in that place. You are calling down all authority and all power for heaven when you lift a praise. What do you need him to do in your life today? Praise him. So we're going to sing this song to you. We're going to sing this song over you. Bree's going to offer a sacrifice through dance. But here's what I'm asking you to do. You, we can't do it for you. I believe like Paul and Silas, there's a power and authority that sometimes you're, you don't necessarily have to be active and expressive and flamboyant in your worship, but your posture of your heart is. So I'm asking you to enter into a posture, posture your heart before the Lord. 
but I ask that you call to mind, what is that thing that you want breakthrough in in your life? What is that thing? And if you need people to pray with you, there's going to be people up on the wings that will pray with you in agreement and battle through with you. But the posture of your heart is what matters. For some of you, you need to get on your knees and on your face before the Lord. For some of you, you need to dance. For some of you, you need to lift your arms and shout. Be free to do what God is calling you to do. Because when we praise, he inhabits the praises of his people. We are calling down the authority and the power of heaven. And I don't know about you, but I want to dwell in the presence of the Most High King. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. So as we sing this song to you, join us if you can catch it. But respond however the Lord leads you. Forever with you I am surrounded 